Tell me if this sounds familiar. You know what categories are, more or less. You've seen the definitions of categories, functors, and natural transformations a dozen times in textbooks and talks and type classes. But every time you try to sit down and learn category theory, you get bogged down in the same place. That's because category theory has a lot of definitions. And to understand these definitions, you have to see examples. So a lot of learning category theory is checking examples, checking that something forms a category or a product or whatever. And I think sometimes this makes it seem like the point of category theory is just to taxonomize or worse yet, obfuscate math. And this is especially true, I think, in my area of programming language theory, where many of us have seen a lot of the setup, but not really any of the good punchlines. A good way to navigate this sea of definitions is to have a favorite concept and see how all the others relate to it. And if you like types, I really think there's no better choice than presheaves and representability. So first off, what's a presheaf? If we have a small category C, that's a category that has a set of objects and a set of morphisms, then a presheaf on C is just a functor from the opposite category of C to the category of sets. So if we just unfold definitions, then first of all, we can see that the data of a presheaf is a bunch of sets and a bunch of functions between those sets. So to consider a simple example, if G is a category that has two objects, V and E, and two non-identity morphisms, S and T, that both go from V to E, then a presheaf on G, or a functor from G op to set, is going to consist of the following data. It sends the objects of G op to objects of set, so it determines a pair of sets, F of V and F of E, and it sends the morphisms of G op to morphisms of sets, or functions. So recalling that in G op, the morphisms S and T go backwards, they go from E to V, then the morphism part of F sends S and T to set functions from F of E to F of V. And at this point, maybe my notation has tipped you off that the data of F is the same as the data of a graph or maybe more precisely, a directed multigraph. We can regard f of v as the set of vertices, f of e as the set of edges, and then f of s and f of t are the projections that give us the source and the target vertex of every edge. Now in category theory, there's also a notion of a natural transformation between two functors. So we can ask if we have two presheaves on G, if we have two graphs, f and f prime, then what is a natural transformation, alpha, from f to f prime? Well, the data of such a natural transformation is a function from f of v to f prime of v, and a function from f of e to f prime of e, that moreover are compatible in a particular way. These are the naturality squares. And those say that if you look at the image of an edge and then take the source or target, that's going to give you the same result as if you take the source or the target first and then you look at the image of the resulting vertex. So in other words, f and f prime correspond to two graphs and a natural transformation from f to f prime is exactly a graph homomorphism of the corresponding graphs. This might be a good time to pause and think about why uh, naturality squares are the same as the condition of being a graph homomorphism. What this example shows us is that there are a lot of things in mathematics that are presheaves. You know, there, there are a lot of concepts that are a bunch of sets and a bunch of functions between those sets. But it doesn't really tell us why it's useful to look at these things as presheaves. I mean, we, we don't need presheaves to tell us what graphs are. So I think this is a good example to keep in mind, but it doesn't really explain why presheaves are important. Now, a second perspective, maybe a more sophisticated perspective, is that a presheaf is a category acting on a collection of sets. And when I say acting, I mean as in the sense of a group action, if you know what that is, or if you don't, then you can maybe think of scalar multiplication in a vector space. So one of the operations of a real vector space, for example, is that you can take any vector, any element of the vector space, and you can multiply it by a real number, and you'll get, again, a vector. 
And this operation scales the vector. This is known as an action of R on V. Now there are a lot of situations where it's natural to think of a category acting on a bunch of sets. In type theory, the analog of this that comes up a lot is that we have a category of substitutions that are acting on collections of terms. So here the substitutions are like the real numbers and the terms are kind of like the vectors. So suppose we have a typing judgment that in context gamma, m is a term of type bool. Then we can think of bool as a function that sends each context to the collection of bool terms in that context. In the empty context, maybe there are only two terms, true and false. But in the context with one variable of type bool, there are at least three terms, true, false, and that variable. But the collection of context isn't just a set. We can regard it as a category whose objects are the context and whose morphisms are substitutions or simultaneous substitutions from one context to another. So for example, the set of morphisms from the empty context to the context x colon a, y colon b are the substitutions of closed terms for both x and y. In this case, a term m of type a and a term n of type b. Then the collection of booleans is not just a function from the set of contexts, it's a presheaf on the category of contexts. If we have a substitution from gamma to gamma comma x colon a, which is to say a term n of type a, then this induces a function going the opposite direction between the sets of booleans in each of those contexts. If we have a boolean m in the extended context, then m with n for x is a boolean in context gamma. This is the multiplication of m by the substitution n for x, or the substitution n for x acting on the term m. This perspective on presheaves as sets with an action is very similar to the previous perspective of presheaves as just sets and functions, but I think there's a slightly different emphasis. Oftentimes a good way to understand a set is to understand group actions on it. To understand vector spaces, we can't get off the ground without scalar multiplication. We wouldn't have concepts like linear independence without it. And in type systems, as soon as we have things like function types, we can't understand the sets of well-typed terms without understanding the actions of substitution on them. That said, there's still one big elephant in the room, which is, why the op? Why are presheaves functors from C op to set? Well, to understand that, we have to not just look at the set of presheaves, but the category of presheaves. For any small category C, the presheaves on C form a category C hat, whose objects are presheaves on C, functors from C op to set, and whose morphisms are natural transformations. And the last perspective on presheaves I want to talk about has to do with this category. And in short, the idea is that we can understand a category C by studying the category of presheaves on C. We do this via what's called the Yoneda embedding. This is a functor from C to the presheaves on C that sends every object A to the presheaf of maps into A. The way that presheaf works is it sends C to the set of morphisms from C to A. And this is a presheaf because the maps into A have an action by the category C, namely precomposition. For every morphism from C to B, we can take maps from B to A to maps from C to A just by precomposing. This brings us to the Yoneda lemma, but that's a story for another day. We can zoom way out and actually forget about all the details of how the Yoneda embedding is defined and just look at it abstractly. So we have a category C and a category C hat of presheaves on C. We have a functor from C to C hat that effectively picks out some of the presheaves on C. Those presheaves that are in the image of this functor are called representable, and these are really the most important presheaves for reasons that I'll explain shortly. But the first really special property of the Yoneda embedding is that if we just look at the part of C hat that's in the image of the functor, it looks exactly the same as C. And what I mean by that is that the morphisms in C hat from Yoneda A to Yoneda B are exactly the same as the morphisms in the original category from A to B. Now the jargon for this is that the Yoneda embedding is fully faithful. So first of all, any question we could possibly have about C 
can be answered by looking in C hat, as long as we know what the representable objects are. But we're just getting started. The C hat has all small limits. That means it has a terminal object, it has products, it has pullbacks, where the Oneda embedding preserves all the limits that C had. C hat also has all small co-limits. These are things like the initial object and co-products and pushouts. And in this case, the Oneda embedding clobbers all the co-limits that C had. Now, at the start of this video, I defined presheaves as functors on small categories, and that was exactly to ensure that C hat has all small limits and small co-limits. This last one is actually the universal property of the category of presheaves. We say that C hat is the free co-completion of C, and I'll explain what that means in a future video, but in essence, it tells us the category of presheaves is exactly the category of small co-limits of representable functors, and that's known as the co yonata lemma for reasons that I can never remember. Now, I know this has gotten a lot more abstract, but the upshot of all of this is, well, two things. First of all, C lives inside C hat, so any question we have about C can be answered by looking at C hat in just a purely formal sense. And... These last two properties say that C hat is extremely well behaved whether or not C is. C hat always has all small limits and small co-limits. So it turns out that C hat is really the perfect place to analyze C. It's like a better version of C that still remembers where it came from. It's going to take more than one video to unravel the mysteries of presheaves. In part two of this series, I'll give a concrete application of using representable presheaves to understand whether category has binary products. And in future videos, I'll talk about adjunctions in terms of representability, about categories of elements, and the co-yonate lemma. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions about this video or ideas for future videos, uh, please reach out in the comments or on Twitter. I'd love to hear them. And I'll see you next time.